The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include super savings and QSuper FUM and members at June 2022. We are back with Deepa Surti from Recruit Talent, who has very generously offered, been bullied, offered uh, a two-part interview. Today's all things candidates. So if you're looking for a new role, Deepa is an expert recruiter. She's been in the industry for nearly 30 years, working a lot in professional services, but specifically in financial services. So we're going to talk, what does the marketplace look like? How can you make sure that you're interviewing any potential employer? And how to make sure that you're negotiating for what you're looking for in a role as well? Deepa. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. I am so excited to do today's conversation. So this is almost part of like a two-part mini series that we sort of made up really because I know that you know all things recruiting. And so we spent a whole episode on looking at it from someone who's hiring lens. But today we're going to focus a lot more on what candidates should think about and know when it comes to the financial services market. So if you are thinking about moving or wanting to understand from an expert recruiter's perspective, all the things that are going on right now, please stay tuned. Deepa, I've got lots and lots and lots of questions for you. Perhaps before we delve in to some of the more nitty gritty questions that I have, I want to actually talk about the landscape at the moment and the market at the moment um, within financial services. And I actually want to get a bit detailed. So I'd love to maybe just almost go chunk by chunk in terms of different roles. So tell me what you're seeing quite specifically for financial services from, say, like an administrative or operational role perspective. I think, um, look, it's it's definitely a candidate market, particularly in financial services and financial planning. But in saying that, I have a little bit of a caveat, and that is that you have to also be good and, you know, you, it's, it's, there's lots of candidates out there and I think that, um, it doesn't matter what level you're looking for a role. Yes, you're in good demand. But, you know, if you're one of those candidates that moves jobs every three months or six months, are you really somebody that an employer wants? Um, you know, you, you have to think about, well, how sellable am I? And, and really look at your skill sets and how you portray yourself on a CV and at, and even at, at interview. Um, so if, you know, like you said, you want to chunk it down into different types of roles. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to just say that across all levels, across all levels, it's, it's, it's definitely a candidate market. Look, the markets move definitely during COVID across all roles. Advisors are commanding good salaries, good roles, um, and and so are really the junior level roles, as a junior level staff as well. Um, everyone's struggling to find good candidates. So um, as a candidate, if you're good, if you can sell yourself and you can portray yourself well, you're in demand. Great. And that's from everyone from um, administrative, power planning, advice. Yes, Everyone. Yeah. It's, it's recruiters are finding it very, very difficult to find candidates across all levels because 
look, uh, you know, all advice practices, they're all looking for it. Isn't that so comforting for the people who are listening who maybe don't feel like they're in the right home yeah. right now to know that they are in you know, the right market to yeah, really be absolutely. able to find something better for them. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'm also finding that, you know, advisors are having to kind of look outside the box as well because you're not mm. going to get the 10 out of 10 person. Um, you know, look, if you do, man, jump for it and go for it because they they are quite rare. But mm. I'm also finding, and I'm certainly consulting with a lot of my clients that, look, Try and have a bit of a plan B because if you don't get 10 out of 10, what what else will you look at? And it could be transferable skills. So mm. let's just see, say it's a, um, you know, you're looking for a CSO. Well, would you look at somebody that's coming out of a advisor services con- call center or would you mm-hmm. look at somebody from a completely different industry yeah. that have done their financial planning qualifications and they're so passionate that they want to get into the industry? So look for that as well. I'm a really, really big believer that if you're passionate, you can, you can learn and, 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 and you will develop those skills. Agree. I'm just thinking about this. So the mortgage broking business that we work a lot with, they have built an, an amazing business, but the people that they get to do all of their sort of client facing, customer service facing roles, they've actually all taken them from coffee shops, like oh, hospitality really? places. Yeah. And it just seems so logical because, you know, you can't, there are some things that you can teach and there are some things that I don't think you can teach. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that that's really clever actually because at the end of the day, it's, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, you're selling, you're selling something. And yeah. so that's that's a really clever way of, of doing it. And, and I guess in that situation, then employers are probably looking at, well, what are your tangible skills and what are your transferable skills that we can use? So I, th- I think that's really clever. Yeah. What do you see in terms of mistakes that candidates make during the hiring process? Oh, I think uh, I see this a lot and it's a real turn off is when candidates just get really cocky. So let's just say, like, I, I know it's a candidate short market, but the number of times you see candidates just get really cocky because they know they're in demand. But that's mm-hmm. also a turn off to employers because... Well, what do I want somebody that's really cocky? What are you going to do with my clients? How are you going to speak to my clients? So that, that's one thing is, yeah, you're in demand, but just, just, just be human. Um, and just be yourself. And I, and I think what a lot of candidates also do is they portray themselves as something that they may not necessarily be just to, to score the job and, and really impress at interview. Um, mm. so for me, I always say to candidates, be yourself. Be it, it, this is this is your job. This is your career. You, it's got to work for you. Um, the other thing I think that where they lack is lack of research. Um, you know, make sure you know who you're talking to. Make sure you've like actually looked at their business. Mm. You know, um, you know, it, it's it's a great uh, you know maybe even some talking points like do you share a common interest in sport. Or something. So, you know, that interview, yes, you've got to be able to sell yourself, but you also want to see if you've got this connection with the person that you're going to work for. Because mm. if you don't have that connection, it's just it's not going to work out. Are people, I'm still stuck on the cocky, arrogant yeah. piece. I need to delve deeper. Okay. Are people arrogant to you? Are people arrogant? Like, tell me how this manifests itself during the hiring process. Definitely as a recruiter, we, we see this a lot. They get cocky because, like I said, they know they're in demand and just look, I, I deal with so many different attitudes. And to be honest, if they can't, if they are rude to me, how are they going to be when they go and work in an employer? Let's just say, um, they go and meet the receptionist. I see this a lot, by the way. God, this is so frustrating when, you know, I might have represented a candidate to a particular client, but they go for their interview for their client. Let's just say they're going to go and interview with you, you, Jess. They are so rude to the receptionist or the person that's there to greet them. And this is where the cockiness comes out because I am king. Can I say the S word? King shit. Yeah. And yeah. so they, they think that, yep, I'm in demand. I'm hot and doesn't matter how I treat everybody else. And so you know a secret. Yeah. I work in a co-working space. And when okay. we did face-to-face interviews, 
I would always ask the reception team yes. what they were like. Yes, exactly. And I do the same. I do exactly the same because mm. who's who's the first person you want to impress? It's the receptionist. That receptionist is in there for a reason and they're kind of like that person that's screening people as they walk in the door. So I think it's a really good gauge of what that person's like. But Great you'd be surprised. It's, you'd be surprised how many people do it. It's the most frustrating thing, and 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 I've seen candidates get knocked out of the race because of that. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Deepa, in your opinion, when do you talk money? Okay, when you are a candidate searching for a yeah. job, you, and yeah. if you're dealing with a recruiter, it's got to yeah. be in the first conversation because there's no point a recruiter trying to represent you if your money's not on the on the same wave if you're not on the same wavelength wavelength as an employer for instance um so you have to have that conversation with your recruiter typically in the first interview um because you've got to remember your recruiter is there to put your best foot forward and they've got to be able to say you know put put your salary expectations up front on the table because otherwise it's just a waste of everyone's time if you're off market I guess if you're dealing with an employer directly and, you know, let's just Mm. say you were uh, trying to source yourself Mm. slightly differently. Um, But again, if you're looking at five, if you're that hot candidate and you're looking at five different jobs, you kind of want to know early on in the piece what the role's paying. I wouldn't be going on the phone call saying, what's this job? What's it paying? Because at the end of the day, you want to be able to sell yourself, portray yourself in the best light and essentially be that person where they want they want to invite you back. And if they want to invite you back, then that's probably a good idea to have that conversation at the, around the first interview stage. But you also got to understand what, what the stages are as well. But typically, you know, I would say um, towards the end of the first conversation, particularly if you know you've got other jobs on the table. And so when, when they're going through a recruiter like yourself mm-hmm. and you're sort of talking about market expectations, my my thinking is that you would say to them, you're not in, like, Correct. that's not what yes. we would expect because it's too much. Do you yes. tell them if it's under? Um, yes, I would, um, but I would also gauge it based on their experience. Like if you're having a five-minute phone call with a candidate, yeah, look, don't, don't, you, you can't, you don't have a proper assessment of the candidate. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, it is, look, I, I've got to be honest with you. I've, I've spoken to so many candidates over the years and I just know what the market's paying in. I mean, I don't know all the roles, but I know a lot of roles due to the, through the course of the roles that I've been recruiting. And if a candidate is applying for a job and I know that they're being paid 10 or $15,000 under market and I think it's valuable for them to know. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would tell them, and and you know, most of the time they'd be really, really happy to hear that. But at the same time, if they're looking for living for a job for whatever reason, and money's not one of them, you know, you just might get good value as well. But um, it's, I think it's very individual. But look, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have that conversation up front. I think it's, I think it's really important, and they should feel like, you know, what well, I've got all this experience. Why am I not being paid accordingly? I may have made this up. <laughs> I don't know if this is right. Yeah. Are female advisors at the moment attracting, because they're in higher demand, more salary? Yes and no. Mm. Definitely female advisors are like every second advisor or every, every sort of practice that I talk to, they've got. They, they would love females in their business. It's not just advice. It's it's like I mean I'm, I deal with accounting firms as well, and I walk into a meeting and they'd say, "Really love to have an accountant that's female." But look, my job as a recruiter is not. To, I can't. I can't say, "Okay, he's the best male for the job, or he's the best female for the no. job." I just. It's about the skill sets and what they can actually bring to the table. Um, unfortunately, there's just not a lot of female advisors out there, and. And I guess um, firms are looking to have that balance as well. So, yeah, look, if you're a female advisor in this industry, hey, you've got – you're already – you're a bit ahead. We don't have enough female advisors, Correct. but do you know what we've got? We've got a lot of female power planners that would probably make really great advisors if they step out of their comfort zone. Yeah. So it's worth thinking about if yeah. they're listening. Yeah. 
Totally. Okay, so what is the general, like let's say you've never or you haven't for a really long time been through the recruitment process. Let's talk about generally what does the process look like from a candidate's perspective and can we talk about how long things tend to take in terms so of lead what do you, So what do you mean, sorry, from a candidate's perspective? what? So like um, they find a job that they think, oh, that's cool, I'm keen to learn more. Like typically what happens, let's, let's use the example that they – have someone like you as a recruiter as part of the process? Because I know it can vary. Obviously, it varies. Um, but as a general theme, when you work with financial planning businesses, what do you see as the general process in terms of what that would look like? Okay. Well, basically, the first from, from a recruiter's point of view, obviously, the first thing we look at is how they present themselves on paper. Um, unfortunately, or... <sighs> Can I say this? But there's just a lot of recruiters that might dismiss candidates on paper too early. And mm. I think when you and, – and this is, I guess, a really hot tip that I would tell employers to, to make sure you consider this through the hiring process is don't dismiss candidates too early. They, you know, they might be a great advisor or a CSO or a para planner, but they're terrible at writing their resume. But should you dismiss them because of that? Um, the number of times I've seen candidates being dismissed, I've picked them up and they've been my success stories and, and, and they have progressed so well in the industries or, you know, whatever, whatever job they choose. So they, um, and you know what? They just didn't write the best resume, but there's underlying, you know, what have they got on their resume? What else can they bring to the table? They've got mm. the experience. So that's the first thing I would say is don't dismiss too early. But from a candidate's point of view, your first opportunity to, when you're looking for a role is to sell yourself. And how do you do that? Well, the first thing is on paper. Um, so you might want to get, well, you should get your resume looked at and get somebody to give you a, a, a independent viewpoint on it. Okay. But also when you're applying, just, just be really, I guess, factual in, in what you put on your resume as well and use lots of descriptive language as well. Um, and don't, you know, I see so many resumes where people just go on and on and on about, they, they just use high level language that so you have to sometimes have to Google the word that they're using. Like it's, it's just, just tell me what you do. Like mm. just give me bullet points and just tell me what you do and explain to me from a human perspective, um, what your experience is. Okay. Um, so that, that's the first thing. And then obviously if, if um, you get across the table of a recruiter or an employer, then you've got that that first phone call is your opportunity to, again, put your best foot forward. So really think about what your skills are and be able to um, say that in the first few minutes of a conversation with a recruiter or a hiring manager. Because you've got to think recruiters and hiring managers are talking to lots of other people as well, or they may not actually in this market. So it's just, you just want to be able to hear what a candidate can tell you in the first few minutes. And if you like what you hear, just invite them in straight away for a, for a discussion. Don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait and say, Hey, let me get back to you, particularly in the financial planning market, contact them straight away. So if we think about this from a candidate's perspective, yep. you nail your resume, mm -hmm. then you're likely to have the first sort of phone conversation. This is a short conversation, correct? Not like a full long interview. How long oh, would you it say depends. they normally go I for? mean, look, I've been in situations where I've just engaged with the candidate very, very quickly. And mm -hmm. um, like I might have said this earlier that if I'm a candidate in a hot market and I'm looking, I'm also talking to other employers. So for me, as a candidate, I want to know what you offer and why should I come and work for you? Mm -hmm. So in some ways, as an employer, you also need to, to sell the candidate about what the opportunity is. But that's also like I have lots of conversations with candidates that I thought would only go for a couple of minutes. They end up going for 20, 30 minutes because mm. they've just got the right questions to ask me. Okay. And it tells me a lot about the candidate. And if candidates have got those type of questions and they can reflect their experience pretty quickly, then they're probably a good candidate. Mm, good insight. And how many, so let's say you go through that phone sort of preliminary interview, because that's typically with a recruiter, I'd imagine. And then you put them forward to the prospective employer. What's this current vibe? Like how many interviews are you seeing as like the norm before someone's making an offer? I've seen 
employers in this market offering candidates into in the interview on the spot. They just know they've got the right candidate. The candidate knows it's right for them. They've done their homework beforehand. They've walked into an interview and gone, this is the company I want to work for. And the vibe is there. I've seen employers offer candidates on the spot, subject to references and, and all that kind of thing. Um, other times I've seen <laughs> people really get having to come back multiple times for an interview. But the longer you have the process, the greater the chance that they're going through other processes that are a lot shorter. So you are competing. So um, candidates, look, typically, if you have had to look, look typically there's about two interviews. Because you also, from a candidate perspective, you also want to meet other people in the business as well, um, not mm. just just maybe say the hiring manager that's in in, in that interview. You'd want to also see who else you you're working for and what what the culture of the team is like, and you know just have a tour of the office, that kind of thing. It's sort of an interesting point that you make around the candidates piece because in the quest to find a good role, do you think people and and obviously like to get a new job and to make it as fast as possible are people are people taking jobs too quickly because Depends. another business that could have been a better fit is taking a bit longer to do their due process Oh, look, it depends on, on the role. Definitely at the junior level, I see that happening a lot because they just, they basically jump for the first opportunity. That, that happens a lot. Mm. I'm, I'm generalizing here, but yeah, it does happen a lot. But if you're an advisor or if you're a para planner, you have a lot more choice. Again, my caveat is, is if, <laughs> if you are a good candidate, but you typically will have a lot more choice. Therefore, you can take your time a little bit. Um, but what will happen along the way is you might get a bit of pressure from recruiters or employers to make a decision. And if I was a candidate in this market and I know that I've got the great skills, listen to all of the stories, listen to all your options because this is your job that you're going to every day and you mm. want to make sure that you make the right decision. And if you're getting forced into making a decision, is that really the company you want to be with? Mm. And I think also from a junior, I don't like that word, but for, from an administrative or, uh, you know, um, operational perspective, I would also think of having done that role, you know, like, progression opportunities and mentorship and development, like how well, rather than just they're going to offer me the, the the right job right now, like I would be thinking one or two years ahead, like how are they going to really invest in me? Absolutely. Yeah. And and quite often candidates get swayed by high salaries up front. Um, mm-hmm. But so as a candidate, just do your research because, yeah, you're right. Um, am I going to get developed here? Do I have good mentors? That's why you should do your research and see, you know, who the people you're interviewing with, what their, what, what has been their journey. Like mm. you said, you started out as a CSO and then you progressed through the industry. Um, what's really important at a young age is particularly in the financial planning industry is that you do get the right mentoring and the right training and, and you can see a path and you definitely yeah. think a couple ahead, a couple, a couple of stages ahead. Yeah. I started as what I would refer to as a switch bitch, um, <laughs> a technical term, which is, do you remember in the old days when you would call the bank and then you would have to be switched to oh, a yes. division? Yes. That was me. You might have right. spoken to me. Um, and it's interesting because I didn't do sort of the traditional ranks through a financial planning business, but I absolutely did that through a bank. Like I was in CSO world for years and years yeah. and years. And I think it's easy to see an advisor or someone that's maybe senior in a business and forget that they have been there too. And Absolutely. they've done their yeah. Yeah. and years yeah. of um, learning and, you know, um, all of that on the job training that then prepares them for that. Because I think without that, you probably aren't going to be as good as you could be. And I think a lot of like having Absolutely. watched a lot of the younger people, yeah. there's this quest to get to the top immediately. Yes. Do you but see just, that? Am I- yeah, absolutely. And and just take take a chill pill, man. You've got to you've got to you've got to learn the stages. And if you don't get the fundamentals right, are you really going to be successful in two or three years' time? Because you don't want to miss miss stuff along the way. So just yeah, so just just um just make sure as a candidate you do your research. Yeah. 
Interesting. One of the, the points on that I want to talk about is like you said that, that some candidates ask you some really good questions that helps you sort of figure out, okay, these people are good and I can see that they, they really care and they want to understand more. What are some of the questions that candidates should be thinking about asking their a prospective employer, do you think? Well, I think you, you've already said some of it. Some of them is, so what training am I going to get? What mentoring mm. am I going to get? Um, what, what sort of my career progression look like? Um, how, what sort of team activities? So, so from a, from a social point of view, point of view, like, what will I get involved in? What, what, what else do you do to, to develop, develop me as a person and, as, and, and, and culturally, how is that reflected? Um, you know, things like that. The other thing is, and these are really good questions. I love it when candidates ask me, so what does the first look, worst, first week look like? And, and what does the first three months look like? And, and what am I getting KPI'd on? Mm. Um, and sometimes, you know, like I said, you don't, you know, we live in this world where you're not necessarily going to get the 10 out of 10 candidates. So, for that candidate that maybe got six or seven out of the skills, I love it when a candidate says, look, I don't tick all the boxes. I don't have it all, but this is what I do want. Would they be, this is a beautiful question, would they be willing to invest in me? Can we pause there? Because I think that's so important because I have seen research that says that men often will do that. They'll look at what the role says and be like, okay, cool. I can do these, but I can't do these. I can put myself forward. But apparently we're obviously generalizing. Often women will look at it and think, oh, I don't, I can't apply for that role because I don't have all of the things that they want. Are you saying as a recruiter, be honest about it and frank about it, but don't let that stop you from Absolutely. moving forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then obviously that's a, that's obviously an insecurity and confidence thing coming. Um, but look, women, you're in demand. Like if you've got some good skills and you really want, you know, maybe you're a mum or, or somebody that's been out of the workforce for a while, but you were doing so well before you went on mat leave or whatever. Mm. And you've got these great fundamental skills, bring them to the table and sell that. Leave your imposter syndrome at home. Yeah. I mean, you, you, we've, I mean, look, I'm mum, I've got kids as well. And, and I mean, geez, I think the toughest job in the world is raising kids. And, you know, you just learn other skills that you just, it makes the workforce look easy. <laughs> totally. I have a dog and I think that's hard. <laughs> yeah. Good. Great, great, great lesson, especially in this market from an expert recruiter. Don't think you need to have every single skill that it says, but be authentic about it. I really like that. I want to also talk about, you know, in the same vein of like being authentic, how do you be authentic in an interview? Because they're scary. Let's be really honest. They're scary. How do you be yourself and make sure that you're articulating your strengths, but also being I mean, do you be honest about your weaknesses? What do you think about that? I, I, for me, yeah, look, your interview is your opportunity to sell yourself. And typically what will happen is, is the interviewer should drive the meeting. Mm. Um, but the interviewer should also try and make you feel comfortable. It is quite nerve wracking coming into yeah. an interview, particularly if you haven't done it for a while. So, you know, and certainly with, with employers that I work with or, and even my own style, when I meet a candidate, I talk about, yeah, you know, the weather and what did you do last week? And hey, so, you know, what did you think about that cricket game on the weekend? Not that I follow cricket, but you know, like just, just, um, just be human about that as well and have some really good icebreaker in the beginning. Make the candidate feel comfortable. Um, but then for yourself as a candidate, yes, be yourself. I, 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 I just, you can see through somebody that's not themselves. Um, yes, you have to sell yourself. Yes, you have to say, these are my strengths, but you, it's, it is okay to say, I don't have this skill set. I'm not very good at using I don't know. I've not used explant. I've used advisor logic or whatever the case might be. Mm. But I've got those transferable skills. So, Mr. Employer, could, if, you know, I've got these skills. Would you help me? Will you help me develop? I think it's a really, from being on the other side of the table, not that I've done it millions of times, but I've done it a little bit. It's so refreshing to have someone say, here's what I'm really good at. And I think I'm, is like my superpower. 
But also, this is what I don't enjoy, or this is something that I'm really not very interested in. And for me, I'm like, this person is um, upfront. This person is a great communicator because they're able to tell me what's good and bad. There's a level of transparency immediately. Like the respect level for me goes way up when they're able to identify the things that they're not good at. Because let's be frank, all of us have things that we're not good at and it's better to find out now. And that's sort of so important because I think in the past, what we've been taught is be like, be perfect at everything, sell yourself to a fault. And then you're setting yourself up to fail. To fail. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. What should people wear to an interview? Is this a silly question? (laughs) I think it's a great question and you'd be surprised how many people turn up to interviews and are just so sloppy. And look, my advice, yeah, oh, absolutely. Let's not go there. I just, I did a recent (gasps) hire and I I helped a client, one of my clients recently and I was shocked how this senior manager walked into this interview and Mm. it put me off straight away and you got to remember the recruiter is the if, if if you know Jess you're a hiring manager and you've outsourced the recruitment function to a recruiter and yeah you might have lots of applicants that you're looking at the first thing me personally I look at is how they present mm. um, because if they have taken the time to dress well pr- polish their shoes do their hair you know like they're all really important factors because it just tells me a little bit about that person as well um, and so I definitely look for that in a candidate. Um, mm. I think that, yes, COVID has meant that people are a little bit more casual in their approach, but I guess I'm a bit old school in that I like to see candidates turning up in a, in, in a suit. Um, okay. It doesn't have to be full shirt and tie or whatever, but I, I think as a candidate, look good, turn up and look your best. And then, you know what, if you end up getting the job and you figure out that, hey, the culture is cargoes in a T-shirt, well, you adapt to that culture, but get the job first. (laughs) Mm. And also arrive early so that you're not in your beautiful suit and polished shoes, but like a sweaty hot mess. Absolutely. And with all the train strikes and delays in transport at the moment, Mm. you should allow another 30, 40 minutes at least. Yeah. Mm. It's better to be early. It's a, it's a good it's a good sign, but not mm, too yes. early. I mean, don't don't come like forty minutes early. Just get there five, ten, fifteen minutes earlier. Yeah, or like go around the corner and have a coffee. Absolutely. Or like, yeah, or a wine to calm your nerves. <laughs> um, no, don't yeah. do that. Don't do that. Joking, no. joking. I'm no, sure no. that's not what you should do. Um, I was giggling because, and I think I might have told you this. <clears throat> I accidentally one day forgot. Mm, forgot. Don't know. I was interviewing some people, and I wore. A ju- I'm a I'm a pretty cash dresser. Oh. I wore a panda jumper, a jumper with a cartoon panda on it. Um, and one of the girl that who ended up we ended up offering the role to, she would never let me live that down. Every time I wear the panda jumper, she talks about it. Um, but she said I was able to see immediately that you're not the typical yeah, advice. financial <laughs> advice. Yeah, but that's great yeah. because that's a reflection of you and your culture and who you are. And I'm sure that would have been a great story to open up with and and that's a great icebreaker yeah yeah me and my panda jumper i probably shouldn't wear it if you're getting interviewed but i do, I do think um you know we know interviewing people is nerve-wracking i get nervous i actually get nervous interviewing people i can't even imagine what it's like on the other side of the fence and i do really think it's my job to make sure people feel as calm as they possibly can. And actually, sometimes I will say to someone, if I can see they're really nervous, look, it's okay to be nervous. Totally fine. It is scary. We will do everything we can to make you feel okay. And if someone doesn't behave like that or doesn't make you feel comfortable or doesn't even try, I also think that that's an interesting observation to make as a candidate. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Mm. absolutely. So... Beyond salary in this, I don't know if we can say post-COVID, but let's just say this period that we're in, what are you seeing companies or employers offer to candidates or being negotiated with candidates that's not just here's your pay packet, that's the offer? Well, um, this hybrid working environment is definitely, you know, post-COVID world is is people have just become used to working from home as well and have that little bit of flexibility. So having a bit of a hybrid 
environment is it, it, it's actually just kind of becoming a bit of the norm, to be honest. So you're seeing a lot of employers offer candidates the opportunity to work a couple of days from home, yep. a couple of days from the office? Yeah, but I think a lot of people, because you've been locked down so, for so long, they didn't want to go back into the office. So mm. um, it's it's like I'm actually seeing so many people saying, oh, no, no, I don't want to work from home. I actually want to work in the office. Mm. But then they also like the fact that they've got that flexibility. Yeah, okay. um, and, and this is what's really good then because it's actually open up for a lot of more candidates to come through because let's just say you've got the the working parent that needs that bit of flexibility to drop the kids to school well can I log in a little bit earlier in the morning drop them to school come back and can I just work a couple of extra hours at night and a lot of employers are just being so flexible around that um, so that's one thing, but you know, like other things, like as as we said before, I'm seeing um, candidates really wanting to invest in themselves. So they are asking the questions around, um, you know, can I have an external mentor? Mm. What what um, other people could I bounce ideas off other than just senior managers or people within the business? Can I have external people to to guide me? Mm. Um, if, if you're, a, if you're a, um, accountant, let's say, and you want to do your chartered accounting qualifications, well, does the company pay for that? Do you give me leave for study? Parental leave, paid parental leave. Interesting. Um, does equity come up much? Um, I do find it at advisor level. Yes. How do you navigate those conversations? Because that's a hard one. I'll try and flick that one. No. Um, well, it, <laughs> it depends. Well, this is, again, I guess, your relationship with your recruiter because if you've had that conversation with your recruiter and if it's a good recruiter, they would be saying to you, so what else can you offer to your candidates? How else do we sell you and your business to your candidates? And if you're a financial planning recruiter, I've been in this industry for a while, um, one of the questions that should come up is, is there a potential for, for equity in a slice of the pie? Mm. Um, and I'm seeing that happening a lot, particularly in smaller to medium practices. If, if they're, they're not only are they paying, um, you know, the market's moved probably about 15% in, in salaries gone up. Yeah. Like an advisor that you might have been able to get pre COVID around that 100 to 120K plus super. Depends on, you know, depends on levels of years of experience can mm-hmm. command at least 15, 20,000 more now. It's, it's not just beyond salary, but good advisors with a few years experience are saying, well, if I'm going to stay in your business long and if I bring in some clients, what can I get? Interesting. It's a good, it's a, it's a robust conversation. It's a good, robust conversation. And I actually think we should say my personal opinion is that I agree with you. The equity conversations that I've had thus far have always been advisor equity conversations, but I don't think that they should just be limited to advisor conversations. Like if you're a cracking power planner and the, and you can build an an amazing business and, and really be a linchpin in that business, why don't you deserve equity like Absolutely. the advisors do? Or definitely a bonus structure or something like that related to your KPIs, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm seeing confidence. that a lot. Like I've got a couple of clients at the moment that I'm doing work for and, yep, they they give, they give they take care of their staff, their turnover is low and they, they say, well, you met all your KPIs, here are all the, the, the you know, the things that we've seen in you and, and what we've seen, uh, you know, how you've helped us be successful and here's a bit of a bonus for you. Mm, I'd imagine these are non-revenue generating the key, stuff. But the, yeah, but yeah, the key right. is obviously once you've got your person, you've got to be able to retain them too. Mm. Um, so what can you do to retain them is is very is very very important, and that's really important for candidates when they're obviously making their choices as well. Yeah. So obviously uh, we're talking about a higher salary than perhaps someone's had before. We're talking about the opportunity for flexibility, and then we're talking about additional ways to either remunerate people Mm. either through a bonus structure or I've seen situations where um, like additional leave has been offered. You know, is that something that you see regularly as well or is that becoming more common? Yeah, I look, I personally haven't seen a lot of that happening. Um, Mm. I do see some, some employers going, look, you know what, 
the last few weeks, we've been at end of financial year and I've seen that you put in the hours and listen, just take a couple of days off or you okay. know, so days in lieu. Yeah. Right. Okay, I see cool. that happening a lot more than say extra days off. But yeah. some employers, you know, particularly at the larger end, some of them are actually offering not just four weeks annual leave, some are even giving them close to five. So it really depends on the company and it depends on how badly they need talent. Hmm. Um, right. Let's have the chat about when it doesn't go to plan. So you're not successful, which is always sad. Mm. What should you do to help you learn and improve for next time? Well, I think you need to understand why you weren't successful in the first place um, and ask for feedback so that you, you need feedback. How else are you going to improve? So um, ask for feedback from your recruiter and, and even in the employers. I mean, if you stuffed up an interview question or you just weren't prepared, that's going to come across. So that's why I always go, make sure you're prepared so you hopefully don't get into that situation. Mm. But I guess the key learnings are, I, I, I would always say, well, what, how can I improve? And Do get people the feedback. Ask for feed- oh, yeah, definitely. And and I would hope, I mean, I, I often give feedback directly to candidates, but I would hope that candidates are getting that feedback. Yeah. Okay, cool. Is there anything else from a candidate's perspective? I mean, it sounds like all in all, this is a fantastic time for someone who's looking for their next opportunity to think strategically about what it is that they want to do and what sort of business they want to work for in the future. Is there anything that you believe we haven't talked about from a candidate side of things that we should discuss today? I think we've covered, I mean, I think the key points are obviously um, do your homework, be prepared. I, I think the other thing is a lot of people are doing a lot of um, behavioural interview questions and situational type questions. Mm. So maybe just prepare yourself with those type of questions before you go and have have your interview. Um, and typically, particularly if you're going to a large organisation, Here's a hot tip. They're going to ask you questions depending on the person's specification. So you've got a job description. The person's specification says, okay, I, uh, we are after these four skills and they're going to be soft skills potentially. So think about questions around those softer skills. For instance, dealing with conflict or, you know, tell me about a time when you, you know, you've, you've had an argument with a coworker co-worker or or a disagreement you know talk, talk about those type of things so think about situations that you've been in and have really clear examples of situations that you've been in and how you would address certain situations mm. if, if it would have come to you you know great 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 point um i love chatting to you you know i can chat to you for all day long yes. uh, before we round out today's conversation can i ask you a couple of rapid fire questions thank you sure, for today sure Firstly, actually, if people want to learn more about you, how can people learn more about you and the work you do? Uh, Just go to my website, um, www.recruittalent.com. Which is one T. Correct. Mm, Yes. Because I make that mistake. Yeah, but that that kind of tells me a little bit about, I'm sorry, not tells me, it tells people about like sort of my history, my background and um, just a bit more about my, my, my approach to recruitment in the industry as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Okay. Some rapid fire questions to round out today's two part series. What's one thing you do deeper to look after your mental health? Oh, um, I think I I go for a daily walk every morning. Mm -hmm. I get up. I just, I've got, I've got kids. I've got family. I run a busy household and work and everything. So for me, my mental health is to go for my walk. And then I do reformer Pilates about three to four times a week. Good on you. Yeah, I know. It's, what, it's getting it because as we get older, man, all the, everything's hurting these days. So I've got to do my Pilates. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, P- Pilates is hard. If you it's, are listening to this and you're like, "Oh, that's cute," you've never done reformer oh, Pilates. I promise you, it is God. so much harder. I nearly, I nearly yes. fell off the machine the first time I did it. <laughs> well, I have fallen. Off. <laughs> it is, it is really hard, but yeah. I'm now addicted. I love it. Amazing. Um, Deepa, what's a piece of advice that you would give to younger Deepa? Say yes. Hmm. If an opportunity comes to you, it feels right and you've got somebody coming up to you and say, hey, I think you'd be really good at this. Have you tried this? Give it a go. Love that. Uh, do you have something on your bucket list that you haven't done yet? Well, hopefully I'm ticking it off at the end of this year and that is um, swimming with the dolphins in Mauritius with my daughter. 
Oh, so cool. I know, Amazing. I know. I've just got to, I might have to have that alcoholic drink beforehand in case I get too close to the dolphins, though, but then again, I might drown. Yeah, anyway. don't, don't have too yeah, many. Maybe not a good idea. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, do you have a book that you would recommend a good read for my fake book club? I think I've got two, actually. One is if you haven't read The Secret by Rhonda Byrne, I would definitely, I love, I just love that book. I love reading it and because I put it into practice, that's the Mm -hmm. first thing. Mm -hmm. And recently I've read this book called um, Unlike a Boss by Alexandra Andrews and it's actually about leadership. Oh, here you go, write it down, practical leadership um, that I think every person running a business and managing staff should read I absolutely love it it's just it's such a practical go-to common sense approach to leadership amazing Deepa thank you so so much for giving us both a hirer's perspective and a candidate's perspective on financial services recruiting there is no one that I would rather chat to about all this stuff than you so an enormous thank you on behalf of the XY community for your time and your input on our little mini series no problem nice chatting (laughs) 